Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for our presentation titled Basic Concepts in Imaging-Based High Throughput Screening and High Throughput Profiling Assay Development. It's my pleasure to introduce you to Joshua Harrell. Joshua is a cellular and molecular toxicologist with the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency Center for Compu excuse me, Computational Toxicology and Exposure. For a complete biography on our speaker, please visit the tab at the top of your screen. If any questions should arise during the presentation, we encourage you to submit them in the Q&A box. Our speaker will address your questions at the end of the presentation. Please join me in welcoming Joshua Harrell. I'll now turn the presentation over to him. Hello, uh, my name is Joshua Harrell and I'm a molecular toxicologist at the USEPA's Center for Computational Toxicology and Exposure. I'd like to thank the organizers of the SBI Squared meeting for inviting me to come give this course, uh, basic concepts in imaging-based high-throughput screening and high-throughput profiling assay development. Get my pointer. Uh, first, I'd like to start with a disclaimer. Uh, the views expressed in this presentation are my own and do not necessarily represent the views of the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, nor do mention of trade names nor products represent endorsement for use. First, I'd like to state the objectives for this session. Uh, in this session, we will explore the basic concepts in imaging-based high-throughput screening and high-throughput profiling assay development for those who are new to this area of science. We will provide examples from a variety of HCS assays to contextualize the assay development process, and we will discuss considerations for experimental design and methods for evaluating high-content screening and high-throughput profiling assay performance. On this slide, I show a few resources that may be of use to the people attending this course. Uh, several guidance manuals for high content screening assay development, as well as some uh, reviews on the type of technology that we will be discussing today. Um, I would like to introduce some key terms to get us started. Uh, the first term is high throughput screening. High throughput screening refers to large scale experiments where combinations of robotic automation liquid handling devices, instruments for detecting assay-specific outputs, and data processing and analysis pipelines come together and are used to evaluate the biological effects of hundreds to thousands of agents, whether they be chemicals, uh, siRNAs, or others, uh, in parallel. Uh, High-content screening is a high, through, is a high throughput screening approach that combines automated fluorescence micro microscopy and quantitative image analysis to assess the biological activity of test agents on a specific process or cellular function at the level of the single cell or single organism. Uh, synonymous with high content screening or high content analysis, high content imaging, image cytometry, um, but HCS is typically used to denote higher throughput. Uh, high content profiling is different from high content screening. High content profiling is an HTS approach that combines automated fluorescent microscopy and quantitative image analysis to assess the biological activity of test agents by measuring a very large variety of features at the individual cell level. A feature being a property of a cell or an organism uh, that is measured using this quantitative microscopy approach. So screening is a distinct strategy from profiling. Although both HCS and HTP both involve large-scale high-throughput imaging experiments, the goals differ. In screening, the researcher aims to measure one or more phenotypes that are visually discernible and choose a subset of hits for further investigation. Assay design is based on a priori knowledge of a biological process of interest, such as a receptor translocation or production of react reactive oxygen species, while profiling uh, collects a broad spectrum of measurements designed to uh, that are captured from each sample unguided by prior knowledge in order to reveal important differences and similarities with other samples. Screening depends on, on a biologist's expertise to interrogate a particular phenomenon, whereas profiling takes an unbiased approach to grouping samples with a higher potential to capture unknown mechanisms of action. So, uh, why consider HCS or HTP? HTS assays can provide information on the biological activity of test agents. However, they provide single low content readouts. 
In contrast, high content screening, HCS, can be used to evaluate many of the same biological process as a high throughput screening assay, but provide more detailed information at the level of the individual cell or organism. HCS can be used to evaluate cellular responses that are not amenable to traditional HCS assays, such as a change in cell morphology or the movement of proteins within a cell. And the potential applications for HCS are broad. Uh, shown here in the box at the bottom of the slide are just a variety of different applications uh, for which HCS assays have been developed, including uh, protein translocation, cell surface receptor activation, cell viability, apoptosis, proliferation, and a variety of other biological processes. So what exactly is a high content screening system? In its most simplest terms, it's a microscope in a box. HCS systems include many of the same physical components as traditional microscopes. Uh, there are specialized components in these instruments to increase imaging throughput, and they also come equipped with image analysis software that allow the users to evaluate the images in a manner that they see fit. Uh, these instruments also typically become, are coupled with data storage and data management solutions. Uh, shown on the left-hand side of this slide is just the configuration of a, a standard epifluorescence microscope, uh, whereas a variety of different uh, HCS instrumentations, uh, instruments that are available on the market are shown along the top of this slide. Uh, there's a, a lot of varieties of high content imaging systems, uh, such as wide field imagers, confocal imagers, uh, laser scanning cytometers, and etc. Uh, knowing the components of your HCS system is key so you can use it effectively to conduct your studies. Uh, for the sake of time, I won't spend a lot of time on the next three slides, uh, but wanted to put forth some information on the components of an HCS system uh, for those who may want to go back and review these later. Uh, but in short, the HCS system is composed of an excitation source, such as a lamp laser LED, uh, a set of excitation emission filter sets, uh, a variety of objectives for low and high magnification imaging, uh, detectors such as digital cameras, uh, a high precision automated stage to facilitate movement of the sample um, and accurate imaging of individual fields of view, as well as high speed autofocus mechanisms. There's also a variety of different uh, optional components of HCS systems, such as environmental chambers, liquid dispensers, and uh, plate handling automation. Also, for the sake of time, I won't spend a lot of time talking about HCS microplates today but uh, wanted ref to refer the folks in the crowd uh, to this review from Trask et al. in 2018, uh, guidelines for microplate selection in high content imaging. Uh, suffice to say that the, the format that's most commonly used in HCS assays to date have been either 96 or 384 well formats. So uh, moving away from the actual hardware and the consumables that are associated with HCS assay, um, I'd now like to talk about different steps in the HCS assay development uh, workflow. Uh, what this flowchart shows are a variety of different considerations for, developing of an, for development of an HCS assay and the question you're actually asking yourself um, when you're actually designing these experiments or designing these assays. And you always begin with your problem formulation. What biology am I interested in? Uh, you then move on to an assay concept. How will I measure that biology of interest? Uh, in terms of cell models, you should consider what cell model you can potentially use to, mo uh, to measure your biology of instrument, uh, biology of interest. And again, what plate format should I use that would be most amenable to my system? Um, once I have my assay concept, what reagents and probes could I use to visualize that biology? Uh, what's the dy dynamic range of the response values that I should expect when uh, evaluating a particular collection of reagents or probes? And uh, what exposure conditions should I be using? How will I actually deliver the test agents to my culture system? And when should I measure the biology of interest? And finally, when should, uh, how will I uh, evaluate assay performance in the context of my assay uh, to show that it's working? Uh, and I state here that even though these, these steps in the process or the thought process of designing HCS experiments are depicted as a linear sequence, that's not always the case. Uh, 
uh, there's a lot of interplay between these different uh, questions you may ask yourself, but they all tend to point back to the central question of measuring the biology that you're actually interested in. So we'll start with the prob problem formulation. When developing an HCS assay, you should begin by asking, what is that biological process of interest? What are the characteristics of that biological process of interest? And what could you use to measure what could you measure to evaluate the effects of your chemical or test agents on this biological process of interest? And overall, what is the goal of your study? In the next few slides, I will present several, exam several examples of HCS assays used to assess different types of cellular biology. We will use these assays to illustrate concepts in HCS assay development throughout the remainder of the talk. The first example is nuclear receptor activation. Uh, the goal of this type of assay is to identify either nuclear receptor activators or agents that inhibit nuclear receptor activation. Uh, the characteristics of the biological system is that the system requires that the receptor to be expressed and functional and that the appropriate stimulus is required to actually activate the receptor. This can be binding of a ligand, uh, post-translational post modification, or dissociation from a chaperone. Uh, this activation results in either the translocation within the cell, which is the focus of this particular assay we'll discuss, uh, as what, or association or dissociation from a binding partner, some type of post-translational modification on the, on the part of the nuclear receptor, or transcription or translation of a regulated gene product. Uh, shown over here on the right side of the slide is a diagram of constitutive androstane receptor uh, signaling pathway, uh, which is the subject of uh, Makowiak et al. 2019. Um, and basically what we're showing here is the assay concept for this nuclear receptor activation assay. Uh, in the absence of ligand, uh, which activates the receptor, uh, the receptor is sequestered to the cytosol. So you can see the, the yellow labeling of the actual receptor outside of the uh, lab blue labeled nuclei within the control condition. Uh, Addition of its ligand results in nuclear receptor activation and then translocation of that protein to the nucleus. And you can see the pattern of the fluorescent intensity changes uh, in response to that stimulus. And that is what you want to measure or evaluate using your high con content screening assay. Uh, the second example is oxidative stress and apoptosis. Uh, the goals of this type of assay are to identify chemicals that produce oxidative stress and cause apoptosis or alternatively could be the identification of chemicals that reduce oxidative stress and prevent apoptosis. Depends on which mode you want to design your assay to actually measure. Uh, the characteristics of this biology is uh, oxidative stress resulting from increased intracellular production of reactive oxygen species or decreased levels of endogenous antioxidant molecules. Uh, this oxidative stress can lead to apoptosis via cleavage of procaspase 3 uh, to an activated caspase 3 and cleavage of PARP by this activated caspase 3, which is what's shown over here in the diagram on the right side of the slide. And the hallmarks of apoptosis that you may want to measure uh, using a high content screening type assay uh, could include reduction in nucleus size, uh, some type of nucleus fragmentation, uh, loss of plasma membrane integrity using a cell impermeable dye, or alternatively, alternatively some type of caspase reagent cleave, uh, caspase, caspase cleavage reagent that when uh, cleaved by an activated caspase actually uh, releases some type of fluorescent signal. Uh, the third example of an HCS assay we will consider today is a steatosis assay for lip uh, lipid accumulation. Uh, the goals of this type of assay are to identify chemicals that either cause steatosis or alternatively may be protective against steatosis and steatosis being the abnormal retention of lipids uh, within a cell or an organ. Uh, this is shown over here on the right in H&E uh, sections of normal liver versus a fatty liver. And as you can see, the cytoarchitecture of these cells changes dramatically in the fatty liver condition as shown by these large lipid droplets that actually accumulate in the cells. Uh, this can occur uh, for a variety of reasons, including dietary factors, uh, chemical exposures, and also signals from peripheral tissue. Uh, and the accumulation of this triglyceride fat reflects an impairment of the normal processes of synthesis and elimination of triglycerides. Uh, 
that is shown here in a bio, in a diagram here in the center of this slide, which basically shows how triglycerides are processed uh, within the liver. Now, these hallmarks of steatosis include the accumulation of these lipid droplets, which can be seen in a variety of different uh, in vitro models, and also production of uh, reactive oxygen species. And the image in the lower right-hand side of this slide shows how you can visualize lipid accumulation using a, a lipid stain. Uh, so the control condition up here is in the upper left-hand corner of this, uh, this four-panel figure. And as you can see, there's a variety of different stimuli that can, that can cause increased lipid accumulation within these cells. And then when, uh, when combined with a drug, you can actually see a, a decrease in the lipid accumulation that was caused by addition of a separate agent. Uh, so this, uh, these lipid spots that are outside of the nuclear uh, label are something that can be measured and quantified using an HCS assay. And the final example we will evaluate uh, in the context of this talk is uh, a neurite outgrowth assay. Uh, so the goals of this type of assay is to identify chemicals that can inhibit or enhance uh, neurite outgrowth. And what I'm showing over here on the right side of this slide is a, a human-derived uh, neuronal cell line uh, after several different after several snapshots up to 24 hours in vitro, where you can see the elaboration of these long processes extending out from the cell body of these cells. Uh, and this is the process of neurite outgrowth. Um, it involves the, the extension of these long, thin processes from the cell body. And these processes contain a variety of cytoskeletal proteins that vary according to the actual type of the neurite uh, versus axons or dendrites. Uh, and these neurite networks become more complex over time. But this is something that you can, uh, you can visualize and measure uh, using immunocytochemistry and high content imaging. Um, so moving on to the next slide. Um, so the type of biology you're interested in is going to have a big bearing on the choice of cell model uh, that you want to select for your particular assay. Uh, so the choice of cell models is, is guided by many factors. Uh, the representative, representative biology, which I've highlighted as the most important factor, but also a variety of practicality or practical factors, such as availability, scalability of the cell model, uh, reproducibility, as far as how consistent you can get the culture model to perform, as well as ease of use. Uh, you also need to consider the growth characteristics of the cell model, uh, the morphology of the cells, potentially cost, and compatibility with your assay concept, such as the neurite outgrowth uh, assay I just mentioned, or the lipid accumulation assay. Uh, there's a a wide variety of different types of cell models. These can include cancer cell lines, immortalized cell lines, uh, stem cell derived or induced pluripotent stem cell lines, also uh, primary cultures. Um, a, a majority, I would say, of HCS assays that have been developed have been on 2D monoculture type systems, such as the one show, shown over here on the right side of the slide. But there's also uh, been some development in the develop. There's also been some movement in the development of three-dimensional culture models, such as spheroid models, and uh, methods for imaging those. So the next step in the HCS assay development is cell model optimization. Uh, cell models can require optimization of many different parameters. Uh, these can include the media formulation, the growth atmosphere, which keeps your cells happy, uh, the plate coating or growth substrate that the cells uh, minimal to growth and, and ma maintenance of the cells, as well as seeding density, passage number, uh, and labeling strategy and stressors. Uh, variability, sensitivity, and dynamic range of an HCS measurements can vary for the same cell type under different growth conditions. And I've shown that over here, uh, an example over here on the right, where these are rep primary cortical neurons grown in either one uh, particular media type, DMEM, or a different media type, neurobasal A versus B27. Uh, shown on the top is three days uh, in vitro growth, and shown in the middle here is seven days in vitro. You can see that the neurite fields get much more complex over time, but when you actually apply the type of quantitative measurements that are used in a high content screening sense to measure either the number of neurons per field or the total neurite length associated with these various media formulations, you can definitely see that the, the formulation has an impact. 
Um, so I state this just to drive on the point that you, you really need to evaluate uh, fairly extensively how well uh, your cultures developed and are maintained within the assay window that you want to use uh, and using the culture uh, media and culture conditions that you wish to use. Here I show another aspect of cell model optimization specifically geared toward proliferative cells. Uh, so what we're looking at in this particular slide are two different cell lines, CARE-CT and RPE1. And what we've done is uh, conduct a cell titer uh, seeding density by time course experiment. And the goal of this time course experiment was to identify an initial seeding density that would result in a culture that is not overly confluent at the time in which you want to make your sample measurement, which is in, in this case at 72 hours. And as you can see in each of these cell types uh, over time, uh, since they are proliferative, the number of cells in the wells actually increases and it increases actually quite dramatically uh, from, from 24 hours out to 17 hours at a given seeding density. Uh, here I've shown uh, side by side the results of a low initial seeding density versus a high initial seeding density for the RP1 cells at 72 hours, which is our uh, goal for actually measuring a particular, uh, for measuring features in the cells. And the take home from this slide is that if you seed too high, you can end up with overly confluent cultures. And these overly confluent cultures can result in inaccurate segmentation of the actual cells that you're intending to measure and also obscure the biology of interest. Uh, that's illustrated down here along the bottom uh, for showing these different uh, cell body segmentation masks for both the low seeding density and the high seeding density um, conditions. And as you can see here in the high seeding density condition, you uh, start to lose the fidelity of the individual cell tracing because the cells are just so tightly packed together. Whereas in the lower density, you actually get very accurate segmentation. And it's also worth noting that this, the cells in these two different conditions actually look very quite different from one another, which if you're interested in a morphological endpoint that's affected in these cells, um, is very important to understand that relationship uh, regarding how your morphology may change uh, based as a function of seeding density. Now I want to pivot away from talking about cell model optimization towards a discussion of HCS assay concepts. So HCS assays are based on three things, the use of fluorescent reagents and probes, the identification of labeled objects, and measuring fluorescent intensities, shapes, and spatial relationships between objects and or pixels. In HCS, the assay concept can be designed to provide intuitive measurements of the biology of interest. Uh, listed here in this table are our four example assay formats uh, and what you may want to measure uh, within each of these assays. So for nuclear receptor activation, you may want to measure the ratio of fluorescent intensity inside versus outside the nucleus. For apoptosis, you can measure nucleus area versus nucleus shape, or perhaps the percent of caspase positive cells. Uh, for steatosis, you can measure the number of lipid droplets per cell, or for neurite outgrowth, the total neurite length per neuron, each of these representing a type of intuitive measurement of the biology that you're interested in. And multiplexing of reagents or, diff or measurement of different features can provide information on different aspects of the biology of interest. Uh, so what this slide shows are just the variety of different synthetic and uh, biological reagents that are available out on the market to facilitate high content screening assays. Uh, there are fluores fluorescent probes. Uh, these are molecules that absorb light at a specific wavelength and emit light at a different, typically longer wavelength. Uh, some of these probes change their fluorescent emission properties in response to a binding event, a chemical reaction, or a change in their immediate environment, uh, which can be leveraged to, to assess the biology of interest. Uh, there's also small molecules. These are low molecular weight chemicals that bind to specific proteins or molecules within a cell. Uh, some examples of those are endogenous fluorescence or conjugated to a fluorescent probe. Um, there are sensor molecules. These are probes that change uh, fluorescent properties after interaction with a reactive molecule within a cell. Uh, examples of these include reactive oxygen and nitrogen uh, stress sensors, as well as voltage sensors. And there's also antibodies, which are immunoglobulins that recognize and bind to specific antigen, uh, antigens. Uh, 
Um, and these antibodies can be uh, conjugated to a, a, fl a fluorescent probe, uh, such as conjugated primaries, or you can use primary antibodies in combination with fluorescently labeled secondary antibodies. Uh, there's also genetic reagents uh, that can be used for high content screening applications. Um, these heterologous protein constructs can be incorporated into the genomic DNA or encoded into extranuclear expression vectors that are actually present in your cell type of interest. Uh, these are the different varieties of genetic reagents that have been engineered for HCS applications. Uh, there are fusion proteins, which are created through transcription and translation of a sequence that encodes two or more proteins, resulting in the formation of a single peptide. Uh, and for imaging applications, uh, these are designed as a protein of interest with a fluorescent protein, such as GFP or RFP, attached to the N or C terminal end of the protein of interest. And the expression of these are driven by the presence of a constitutively active, constitutively active promoter uh, inserted into the genetic sequence. Alternatively, there's the, a method known as fluorotagging. In this method, a heterologous expression of a fusion protein uh, consists of the protein of interest and an enzyme that reacts with a particular class of fluorescent probes. Uh, this results in a fluorescent labeled fusion protein, but also provides flexibility regarding the wavelength of the fluorescent probe you can incorporate into this type of system. Uh, there's also fluorescent reporter systems. So in these particular systems, heterologous expression of the fluorescent protein is driven by the activation of a promoter sequence as opposed to being constitutively driven within the cell. And this is used to detect activation of intracellular signaling pathway uh, by an endogenous proteins. Often when conducting HCS assays, it's desirable to multiplex different fluorescent probes in order to evaluate different aspects of the biology of interest. However, care must be taken during the multiplexing of probes to minimize the crosstalk across those fluorescent channels. Uh, what I've shown here in the middle of this slide are the excitation and emission spectrums for various combinations of fluorophores. Uh, if you focus here on the DAPI plus Alexa 48 diagram, what you can see is the excitation spectra of DAPI in the blue dotted line, which is excited by a laser, and the emission spectra, which is the filled in curve in the darker blue. Uh, the filter set that's used is able to sample the wavelength of emitted light uh, from the DAPI stain within the, the solid blue band. When we add the Alexa 48 antibody or uh, reagent, uh, you can see here the excitation spectra in the teal for this particular reagent and the laser that's exciting it, and the, the emission filter that allows you to uh, sample the particular wavelength of light uh, within this, this solid teal distribution here. So you can consider that, that these two reagents are compatible with one another because the, the excitation wavelengths don't overlap and you're able to, to a fair extent, uh, separate the emission spectra of these two. Uh, when you try to multiplex a third probe, which is shown over here on the right side of the slide, uh, what I've shown here in the A488 plus A541 is a combination that's incompatible. And this is due to the fact that the excitation and emission wavelengths of these two fluor probes are too close together in terms of the wavelength spectra. And you won't be able to separate the signal from the two uh, using a, an, a, the same excitation or emission, uh, uh, the same excitation sources or emission filters. In contrast, if you were to substitute A541 for A568, then you do get a favorable excitation emission profile, which allows you to confidently multiplex uh, these reagents and, and measure the signal and separate the signal that is emitted from each. Uh, general rules of thumb for multiplex and fluorescent probes is that targets with higher signal should be imaged in the lower wavelengths than targets with lower signal. So the, the more intense signals uh, should be imaged down at the lower end of the spectra. And you should also routinely evaluate the crosstalk between channels using single plex labeling and evaluation of off-channel images uh, during your optimi optimization process. Uh, the next step in conduct a, conducting of a HCS assay after you've done the image acquisition or the labeling of your sample with the fluorescent probes and the image acquisition is called segmentation. And this is the separate separation of signal from background. Uh, so what I'm showing here is a pixel intensity distribution uh, for a particular image. 
And there are areas of this pixel intensity distribution which are associated with background, which have very low pixel intensities. And these would be the black pixels uh, shown within this Hertz labeled image here. And then uh, the brighter objects or the brighter pixels in this image are related to the foreground objects. And so what the HCS imaging algorithms can do is actually separate these bright objects on a dark background and trace them as a, uh, segment them, which is uh, tracing as individual objects. Um, I've shown this here for two examples, uh, the Hertz nucleus stain and nucleus trace, as well as using segmentation to identify a, a particular lipid spots in a Nile red stain of a, of a hep RG cell that has been treated with lipid. Uh, once these objects have been identified, then their properties and associations with other objects can be measured as endpoints in an HCS assay. Uh, so back to our uh, different examples of the HCS assays we're considering. Uh, this assay concept uh, for apoptosis, uh, the cell model that we're speaking about here is the MCF7 adenocarcinoma model. Uh, the biology of interest is in apoptosis. Uh, the visualization approach is this cafe, caspase cleavage DEVD peptide, uh, the Thermo Fisher Selenate caspase 37, or uh, alternatively the Incusite uh, caspase 37 reagent, and a nucleus counterstain, which is Hertz 33342. Uh, for the image analysis approach, we want to identify the nuclei and select the nuclei of interest, and then measure the caspase 37 intensity within the nucleus mask scoring each cell as a responder or a non-responder based on the intensity of the caspase label within each of these masks. And then our intuitive output from this uh, particular HCS assay is the percentage of caspase positive cells. Um, this just visualizes some of the results from this type of assay. Uh, here we're showing three different images, a DMSO treated uh, baseline, uh, starosporine treated cells, which uh, produce a partial response in the cell model at this particular point in time, where you can see some cells beginning to get, undergo apoptosis and showing the compacted nuclear morphology in the green labeling. And then we see a, a separate uh, reagent called ionomycin, which uh, produces a full and uniform response, and this is a cell death uh, apoptosis response. And basically what we're showing down here on the uh, bottom part of these uh, the bottom portion of this slide are the uh, distribution, the cell level distributions of uh, average intensity in this uh, green fluorescent channel for our DMSO starosporine and onomycin treatments. And what you can see is that the, uh, as these different uh, intensities of stimulus are applied, that the distribution of fluorescent signal intensity changes. Uh, according uh, from the DMSO to this partial response profile, which we see in starosporine, to this uh, uniform response profile that we see with alanomycin. And you can use that to actually, uh, there's a couple of different approaches that you can use to actually calculate a quantitative endpoint out of that. Uh, you can either uh, measure the well level mean of the caspase intensity in the uh, green fluorescent channel where the caspase reagent is imaged. Um, and the disadvantage of this is you will not be able to detect any type of rare events associated uh, with your uh, apoptotic response. It may obscure some of those partial responses. Or you could use a percent responder approach where you actually uh, score each cell based on the uh, average intensity of the apopto apoptotic label within the nuclear mask. And in this, you can actually start to detect some, some rare events as far as uh, partial responses of your cells to this apoptotic stimuli. Um, so how do you actually use this percent responder uh, type approach? You have to determine a percent responder gate. And this is based on a central tendency of the control data plus a multiplier of the variability in the fluorescent signal you're measuring. For example, uh, any cell that has a fluorescent intensity of, of caspase signaling that's greater than or equal to the mean plus or minus two standard deviations of your controls would be scored as a responder. Anything less than that would be scored as a non-responder. Um, and then you can actually see here how various multipliers of the control standard deviation affects your percent responder outputs in response to either DMSO, ionomyosin in green or star sporing in blue. So this is another type of optimization that you can do to actually set your responder gating. 
for this uh, particular high content screening assay. Um, here's another assay concept we touched about earlier in the talk, the steatosis assay concept. Uh, the cell model here is uh, differentiated 2D HEPRG cultures, which contain uh, a mixed population of both cholangiocyte-like cells and hepatocyte-like cells, which actually have different uh, morphology in terms of their, uh, their appearance. Uh, the biology of interest we're measuring is lipid accumulation in these cells, and the visualization approach is the Nile red labeling of those lipids with the nucleus counterstain. In terms of our image analysis approach, we want to identify the labeled nuclei, select the nuclei of interest based on the morphology of the hepatocyte-like cells, which are shown here in green. Those are the smaller, more compact nuclei. And then define a region of interest around each cell type, uh, and then identify the lipid droplets within each region of interest. And the intuitive output that you achieve from this high content imaging approach is the average number of lipid droplets per hepatocyte-like cell. And thirdly, uh, another assay concept, uh, neurite outgrowth. Uh, our cell model here are these human embryonic stem cell derived neural cultures. Uh, our biology of interest is the extension of neurites from the cell body. And our visualization approach is beta tubulin immunocytic chemistry with a nucleus counterstain. Uh, as far as our image analysis approach, we want to identify the nuclei as before and select the nuclei of interest and use positional information from the nucleus channel superimposed on the beta-3 tubulin labeling to identify the cell bodies and conduct our cell counts, and then trace and measure the neurites in this assay. And the intuitive output here for this particular assay is neurite lengths per neuron. Another critical component of HCS assay design is the use of controls that allow you to, to evaluate different aspects of assay performance. Uh, listed in this table are a variety of different control types, such as untreated controls. These are assay wells that do not receive any test agent. Uh, vehicle controls are assay wells uh, that receive the test agent delivery vehicle, uh, such as DMSO, but did not receive a test agent. Uh, positive controls are assay wells that receive a test agent known to produce an expected effect on an assay, whereas negative controls are the opposite. These are assay wells that received a treatment that is not expected to have an effect in an assay. Uh, there's also uh, no-label control wells, which are assay wells containing cells, treated or untreated, that were not labeled with the detection reagents that allow you to evaluate the background signal that may be emanating from your biological system uh, in the absence of the detection reagents themselves. Uh, this is just an example of how assay controls can be implemented uh, in untreated versus vehicle to determine a vehicle tolerance, that is, at what concentration does the delivery vehicle of your test agents actually affect the assay. Uh, this is in the context of a neurite outgrowth assay, uh, where we actually are tested uh, DMSO concentrations ranging from 0.05 all the way up to 5%. And as you can see in the different uh, morphological measurements of interest, average number of neurites per neuron or total neurite length, you start to see significant effects at concentrations of around 1% DMSO. So for optimization purposes, you would want to use some type of uh, vehicle concentration that is less than that, so you're not affecting the biology of your system. Um, this is an example of a uh, high-content screening experimental design in 384 well plate format that incorporates each of the type of uh, control conditions that we just discussed. So the no-label controls, the untreated vehicle controls, and, and also positive and negative control chemicals in concentration response, as shown in the red and the blue. Uh, we also have a variety of test agents in this plate design, each uh, upper and lower half of a column representing a test agent in eight-point concentration response. And what you can do with these types of data is actually evaluate the reproducibility of, say, potency values you would uh, see in a high content screening uh, concentration response mode type experiment. Uh, in particular, we're looking here at an example of cell viability. So here we have the percent, percent responder cells in panel A, which represent the, uh, the magnitude of the cell viability response and also the normalized cell count. And each one of these lines represents the the positive control starosporine from each individual assay plate. And as you can see, these, these concentration response curves are, are virtually superimposable upon one another, which indicates uh, you're getting good assay performance uh, 
using these positive controls, uh, this positive control chem chemical to evaluate that. Uh, you can also perform concentration response modeling to identify a potency associated with each one of these curves, which is shown over here on the right side of the slide. And as you can see, for each of the plates that were actually measured in this experiment, this, uh, this potency estimate is actually quite consistent. If these values were spread all over this, uh, this plot, uh, you may consider that, or, or if one value was, say, very far offset from the rest, you may look at that plate as having poor performance and may actually consider uh, perhaps excluding it from your data set. Uh, there's also a concept that you need to characterize for HCS assays known as dynamic range. So the theoretical dynamic range is the range of values that can be measured or calculated for a particular assay endpoint. Uh, for each of the different assay concepts that we've talked about throughout this talk, I've listed the endpoint and the theoretical dynamic range that you could observe for each of these. For, exist, for example, a percent responder is probably the easiest to understand. Uh, the, if you're scoring each cell as a responder or non-responder, then the theoretical dynamic range you can achieve is between zero res response and 100% response. Uh, likewise, likewise, for nuclear receptor activation, uh, if you're considering intensity in a nucleus, uh, the background to the upper limit of your camera might actually be a theoretical dynamic range for this particular assay. In contrast, the empirical dynamic range is the different in, difference in values between your control conditions and the most efficacious positive control condition you, you've included in your experiment. And characterizing this empirical dynamic range is an important step in evaluating whether or not your HCS assay is actually capable of detecting biologically meaningful changes uh, that are based on the biology of the system you're interrogating. So this is just an example of a HCS assay performance metric uh, known as the Z-factor. And, and basically what this is is a calculation comparing the distribution of signal in both your control condition and your positive controls. And uh, this chart that has been published by Zhang et al. for quite a while kind of adds an interpretation to the Z-factor ranges that you may observe when comparing uh, your controls versus treated, uh, positive control can treat it uh, in this manner. So uh, a Z factor of one indicates an ideal assay, whereas a Z factor between 0.5 and one is an excellent assay, and just above zero is a marginal assay. Uh, if it's less than zero, then there, there's really too much overlap in between your, your, your control signal and your positive control signal to discern much of a change uh, at all in the response you're trying to measure. Uh, and this plot over here shows a percent responder uh, for cell viability where we've done a Z prime calculation and shown that the, the controls in red and the star sporing treated cells in blue have a Z prime of about 0.61, which is, falls in the range of a, of a fairly good assay. Uh, now I'd like to pivot again from the topic of HCS assays to the topic of high throughput profiling assays. In contrast to HCS, high throughput profiling assays or HTP assays measure hundreds to thousands of phenotypic features, and the endpoints reported are not always intuitive. Uh, the highly multiplex nature of HTP assays requires a modified approach for evaluating assay performance that uses reference chemicals and the concept of profile concordance. What I'm showing over here on the left-hand side of this slide is an example of different phenotypic features that can be derived from a phenotypic profiling assay known as cell painting. So in this particular assay, uh, Organelles within the, uh, various organelles within the cell are labeled with a variety of different fluoroprobes. Uh, the cell is divided into a variety of different compartments, and that each uh, combination of compartment versus uh, fluorescent channel, uh, the distribution or the, the properties of the fluorescent label uh, within those different compartments are measured in a variety of different ways, resulting in, in a large number of uh, feature outputs at the level of the individual cell. Uh, these are just some examples of the types of phenotypes you can observe using this cell painting assay uh, with phenotypic reference chemicals. Uh, these chemicals elicit reproducible but distinct profiles of phenotypical, phenotypic effects, and those profiles may be specific for a particular channel or organelle or may affect many of the components of the cell. Uh, a good comparator here are the chemicals along the, tops, uh, the top row of this image. Uh, so each pair of images is a solvent control versus a treatment. 
And what you can see with this particular chemical berberine chloride is that the, the phenotypic effect that's induced here is a change in mitochondrial compactness. So you can actually see the, the mitochondria labeled in red changing morphology uh, between the control and the treated. Uh, in comparison, over here on the right-hand side is what happens with treatment with the toposide in these particular cells. You see a massive cell swelling and changes in a variety of different organelle features uh, as a result of this particular chemical. And the cell painting assay or other phenotypic profiling assays like it are designed to just measure uh, a general change from the ground state of the cell to a particular phenotype without any, prior, any a priori expectation of what that phenotype would actually look like. Um, this, uh, once individual features are measured in this type of profiling assay, they can be normalized to vehicle control and scaled to facilitate comparisons across features. So, so what we're showing in this, this heat map are uh, scaled normalized values for four test chemicals, test and concentration response, uh, rapamycin, CA compound, berberine chloride, and etoposide. And the, the rows are arranged from lowest concentration to highest concentration. The features that are derived from the cell painting assay are arranged in columns. And what you can see is that with the increasing concentration of these test chemicals, you see either uh, an increase or decrease in the effect size uh, for each of the phenotypic features that is measured. And these, these profiles actually look quite different from each other uh, across the various chemicals that were tested in this experiment. Uh, this is just an example of a high throughput profiling plate design where uh, a variety of different test chemicals, the, the concentration series shown in green, are arrayed on the plate along with a variety of phenotypic reference chemicals in concentration response, a cell viability control in concentration response, and a large number of, of DMSO controls. And what this uh, configuration of the experiment allows you to do is actually to objectively evaluate high throughput uh, profiling assay performance. Uh, so what we have here is a figure that was published in Niffler et al. 2020, uh, where we're actually showing uh, the phenotypic profiles for a particular concentration of these four drugs uh, across nine different, or 12 different test plates rather. Uh, so each row in these heat maps are one example of an instance where this chemical was tested and each row is an independent assay plate. The features are once again arranged uh, in columns across this heat map. And what you can see is that across uh, independent tests of this chemical on different plates, the profiles that are actually produced for any particular chemical are quite similar uh, across the different assay plates, but also quite different from one another. And uh, by using this combination of the four of these drugs, uh, you can see that most of the phenotypic features that you actually measure as part of the cell painting assay are affected in one way or the other. Uh, you can take these profiles and perform a correlation of the uh, effect size here and actually show that you're getting very strong reproducibility uh, for three of these chemicals uh, using this particular method uh, across your different assay plates. Uh, berberine chloride, this particular approach didn't work so well just because of the, uh, the, the small number of features uh, that, were, that were affected for this particular drug. Um, but as opposed to using a, a Z prime calculation, which is focused on a, you know, a single endpoint, uh, you can use this type of more uh, integrated type of approach to make sure that the uh, assay is performing well on each instance that you run it. Uh, you can also do concentration response modeling if the uh, experiment was performed in, in concentration response mode and come up with potency estimates for the threshold for biological effects that you, you can then compare across the different assay plates in your system. And the hope would be that if your, your assay is functioning well, that the spread on these uh, potency values would be very tight uh, across your different assay plates. So time is running short for this presentation, but I did want to take one moment to touch or machine learning approaches that could be applied in the context of HCS and HTP assays. Uh, so what's shown over here on the left side of the slide is a figure from Sheeter et al. 2018, uh, which basically shows the workflow for applying machine learning type approaches uh, to high throughput profiling data. It begins with uh, uh, segmentation free analysis where phenotypic feature profiles are calculated at the level of the individual cell and then profiles for individual uh, chemicals are calculated based on the, the 
phenotypic features that are measured at the cellular level. Uh, then machine learning approaches are applied to, to actually separate chemicals that look similar to each other or different from control, which is shown down here in the bottom uh, left-hand side of this slide. So what you can see in the red point cloud and the blue point cloud are two populations of treatments who've, uh, whose phenotypes have actually diverged from the control treatment, which is shown in black. And this would be indica indicative of some type of biological activity uh, that is being induced by the chemicals uh, or the treatments that have been applied to your cellular system. Uh, shown over here on the left right hand side of the slide is a particular example from Lou et al where he uh, that group applied a method known as support vector machines uh, to characterize the uh, the concentration dependent change in phenotypes um, away from the control ground state uh, as as a function of concentration index and in in a very high level summary what this uh, method allows you to do is evaluate phenotypic changes away from your control state, no matter really what they look like as a function of concentration, but to be able to model that response as you would uh, in a concentration response capacity, similar to any other endpoint that you may measure, uh, which is conceptualized here in panel B. Uh, an example of this for a, uh, a chemical camptothecan is shown over here on the far right of the slide, where they've done uh, basically plotted a principal component type uh, plot here showing uh, different phenotypic groups that are uh, that are emergent as a function of camptothecan dose index and actually shows the concentration dependent departure from the control ground state uh, in the lower uh, right hand side panel. Um, we don't have much much time to, to digest this information. I, I will say that I believe there are other presentations as part of this SPS Squared Education Day, which will focus uh, more specifically on machine learning in uh, HCS assays. Um, so in summary, I'd like to conclude by saying that high content screening assays are, are powerful tools for interrogating biology. That high content screening assays can evaluate many aspects of cellular biology that are not amenable to evaluation using non-imaging based methods. Uh, that HCS assay concepts are customizable to a biology of interest and provide intuitive outputs of the biology. Uh, that there are many interconnected steps in development of success of an HCS assay. And uh, that there's a lot of resources and a lot of examples uh, out there that can help you find your way. I'd like to thank all the folks at EPA who contributed to the content of this presentation, as well as my uh, colleagues at Perkin Elmer. And at this time, I will take any questions. Joshua for that informative presentation. We will now move into the live Q&A portion of the presentation. And as a reminder, please submit your questions via the Q&A box. All right. Our first question is, when optimizing an HCS assay, what kind of treatment conditions should you use in the optimization steps for image acquisition and image segmentation? Well, Kaylee, uh, thank you. Thank you for that question. And thank you, everybody, for attending. Um, happy to speak to that in some ways. So uh, the conditions that you should use for optimizing both the acquisition steps and the segmentation steps in an assay really depends on the assay concept you're trying to use. Um, so there's different rules of thumbs you can follow. For, for instance, an assay where you're interested in measuring the change of intensity of some type of labeled object or labeled signal, uh, what you want to use for those optim optimization steps are both uh, control treatments and where you actually see the, the basal state of your test system, as well as a positive control treatment that would, that would cause what you think to be the, the most maximal response you could see in the system. And then use that, both of those uh, image types in tandem to actually figure out what type of image acquisition settings you need to use to cover that, that dynamic range of that signal 
and what the what segmentation strategies would be most appropriate for both types of conditions. Great, thank you. Our next question here is, what are some good QC practices to use when setting up an HCS assay? Yeah, so, the, so there's quite a few QC practices that can be put into play throughout the HCS assay development workflow. Uh, some of the most common have to do with uh, actual uh, uh, image adjustment uh, after you've actually acquired the image, such as flat field corrections and things like that. Uh, to make sure that there's no kind of systematic uh, imaging artifact that may be present in your images. Uh, another good, C, good QC practice that you can put into play is uh, during the process of, of image segmentation, you can actually install uh, certain processes within that, that segmentation workflow that may help you either identify wells where you have some type of dust, debris, some, some type of signal that's not really associated with your assay and help you exclude those types of wells or otherwise mask out those objects that you really just don't want to measure. Um, so, so those are a few good QC practices to put into place. Great, thank you. And it looks like we have time for one more question. And this one says, how many fields of view objects, images, should I acquire in each well? <laughs> um, uh, that's a good question. And there, there's really no easy answer to that. It's really gonna depend upon your particular application when you're actually building the HCS assay. So uh, things you can do during the optimization steps to explore that question is, you know, run a few experiments where you sampled a varying number of fields or a varying number of cells, uh, both in your control and in your positive control treatments and see where your the, the difference in your signal actually stabilizes. At what point have you collected enough fields or enough objects so that your positive control can easily be distinguished from your vehicle control? Um, so, so really it's going to be an application by application situation. Um, you also need to take into account uh, your, your databasing capabilities and your image storage capabilities. Um, a good rule of thumb is not to collect more images than you need to answer the question about the biology. Uh, otherwise, you're just eating up, eating up a lot of storage space on the back end, uh, collecting uh, over too many images. Thank you again, Joshua, and thank you to the audience for your outstanding questions. As a final reminder, any questions that were submitted and not answered today by our speaker will be addressed and answered via email. And this presentation will be available for on-demand viewing in the SBI2 virtual conference for 12 months. Please remember to share it with your colleagues who might be interested in today's topic, and don't miss out on our other presentations on our agenda. Thank you for your participation. Until next time, goodbye.